Welcome everybody uh, to the Sarah Little Turnbull uh, lecture series. This is the first in a in a series of seven uh, lectures. Uh, the last one on November seventeenth will culminate in a in a panel. Um, before we begin, though, I just want to hand it off to President Lemons, who is here just to give a brief statement about the series and to um, to get the ball rolling. So, President Lemons, whenever you're ready. Thank you, David. It's great to be here this afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, this is a great launch for the Turnbull Design Speaker Series and uh, generously funded by a gift to the college from the Sarah Little Trumbull Foundation as a part of a larger project, which is a Sarah Little Turnbull Design Initiative. And that's a pilot program that uh, we anticipate will be built upon in coming years into a major design initiative at Lehman College. 2020 has been a year in which many institutions, including Lehman, that is a proud Hispanic serving institution, in fact, majority Hispanic students, have been exploring ways to expand opportunities for their students, faculty, and staff, taking into account the need to encompass diversity and inclusion. And that is a significant aim of this collaboration between Lehman, the Lehman College Art Department and the Lehman College Art Gallery to encourage and explore design from many perspectives, including race, class, ability, gender, and more. Another goal of this series is to help students explore what demands are being placed on design to help meet the many problems that touch all aspects of society. And to quote from the proposal for this initiative, this pilot initiative will reaffirm the importance of design education and its place in the world. Most important, this initiative creates a pathway into the design fields for some of the most talented of Lehman College's art students who represent a student body that is one of the most diverse in the world. So these three hour long talks that we'll be having in this series are open to the public, uh, seven in total, taking place uh, Tuesday starting today uh, and through November 17th. Each of them is a 60 minute discussion, which will highlight how a designer has entered a daunting field with determination to shape the contours of our society. We have a stellar group of presenters uh, lined up for this series, starting with today's presenter, Laura Silva, uh, who we're thrilled to have. So I urge you to watch the entire series, which I, I'm positive will be fascinating and will really be groundbreaking for the college and beyond. We're deeply grateful again to the Sarah Little Turnbull Foundation <clears throat> for supporting this series and the other aspects of the Sarah Little Turnbull Design Initiative at Lehman College. And with that, David, I'd like to turn it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, President Lemons. Uh, I uh, really appreciate your, your assistance here. Um, uh, again, welcome everybody. Uh, I just wanna also welcome Laura Silva. She's um, from Bank of America. She is here, but don't let that scare you. She's here to talk about uh, design and accessibility and inclusion um, and before we begin discussing, I, I just want to let everybody know that there is a, queue, a question and answer uh, function here in the webinar. If you have any questions and answers, or if you have any questions, we'll provide the answers, hopefully. Um, and you can, you, can, you can submit those questions at any time. We'll do our best to kind of, and we, Laura and I talked about this, we think it's good to kind of roll these questions into our discussion. So totally feel free to ask questions that kind of tack on anything we happen to be talking about. It's totally fine. So uh, Laura, welcome again. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, we're, today we're gonna, be, I'm sure we'll talk about a bunch of different things. I hope <laughs> we'll, we'll keep to the president's um, one hour time limit, although I, I can't promise anything because <laughs> um, I really can't. But um, you know, we're, I wanna talk about Latinx inclusion in, 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 in inclusivity and in design and really just our culture in general. But I do just wanna maybe generally just talk about inclusion in general, when we say inclusive design, what we mean is design that focuses on a diversity of people and the impact of this on design decisions. That's generally what we'll be talking about throughout this series. Um, and I do wanna talk about Latinx inclusion with you, 
but I thought maybe you could, you have a pretty unique story about what brought you here to the US and um, it mirrors a lot of the stories of our own students, as you, as you may know. Um, and, then, and then talk about your, your immigration story here that, that brought you from Bogota to the US. Yes, all right. Well, thank you, President, uh, for being here. Thank you, David, and thank you to everyone that's taking um, a little time of your day to stay in front of a computer. I know that that is heavy and challenging, so I appreciate um, your focus, your attention. I hope you got some water, some tea. You know, you have some candles around you. Relax mm -hmm. a little bit. It's a conversation. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so, hola a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por invitarme. Estoy muy contenta de estar aquí en, en esta universidad. Uh, thank you, everyone, for inviting me. I'm really, really happy to be in this university speaking today. Um, so, yes, let's 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 talk. Let's talk. Let's, yeah, let's where we start. Let's start back in 2006. That's where I landed here uh, in the United States, in Florida. So, uh, with my family, we came here um, as many families. Um, seeking asylum from my country, uh, Colombia. I'm from Bogota, uh, which is the capital. And, you know, uh, it's very interesting coming to the United States when you are um, right at the beginning of your teenager uh, years. I came here one month shy from 13. So it was a very like impactful time to come and completely change your surroundings, your culture, your language. I came here as you can tell, not speaking any English at all. And um, immediately, of course, was put in ESL classes, which is English as a second language. Mm -hmm. And um, and went right through it. You know, like, it kind of, uh, I started my adult years when I first started to the United States because the childhood, right, your teenage years, uh, I really couldn't have that because I was busy translating tax documents and as, as, as many of you guys know, you know, translating tax documents or medical forms or my brother, signed, uh, he was the one that signed me up for middle school because my mom didn't understand the forms. She just signed them. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was very interesting coming to the United States. And even though I came to South Florida, which is very, very much Latin culture. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my dad, who, had came, who came here a few years before us, um, brought us to a place in South Florida that was predominantly white. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very away from the Latin culture. That's pretty much what he wanted. Um, as, as, you know, as, as it has happened through many generations, uh, immigrant parents uh, want to take away, you know, the Latin like lat the Latin culture away from their kids so that they can assimilate a little mm -hmm. more into the culture and and that that was that was his way of, of thinking that he was doing the best for me and my brother and mm -hmm. and you know there's I don't, I'm not saying that's wrong or that's that's good that just it is what it is and, and right. some parent decided to do that and that's what he decided to do for me so how did you, uh, well, tell us a little bit about what you do at, at Bank of America and, and kind of how, how you really maybe start by just talking about how you got into design. Of course. So uh, I, I am not a designer by trade. I did not go to school for design. And I think that's a very, very key part of this is that you don't have to be um, going to school for design to be a designer. Mm -hmm. um, I went to school for writing. I went to Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia, and I majored in writing. To this day, my grandmother has no idea what I studied in college. <laughs> she thinks I went to school to write poems. <laughs> to this day, she thinks that's what I did. Uh, and well, we did do that. Uh, we did write some poems. Uh, we went to school for learning how to write for media, for legal documents, for broadcasting, for uh, fiction for novels from nonfiction um, for marketing. We I went to school for pretty much like communication. Yeah. If you if you can translate it, right? That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, it, that's that's pretty much what it is. I just spent four years writing essays um, all day long, every single day, uh, and 
and I try to see, you know, where I could you utilize those skills of storytelling to come out of school and make money, right? Because that's that's the goal. That's that's what I came here to do. That's why my parents brought me here to be better and and do better than they did. And um, and money is a big part of that. So I, I said, you know what, technology is the space where where it is at uh, the most. And and my brother at that time was he was studying industrial design in the same university and through him who who I, I i say my brother has been like my north star mm -hmm. he is the one who constantly uh is plugging me in and keeping me grounded as to where the realities are and he said laura make if you have a major that is fantastic have a minor that is um functional yeah and so my minor my minor was service design and service design is pretty much just the study of services. It could be a literal coffee shop or an app and, and understanding a clientele, understanding customers, understanding the environment and seeing the pain points or like the trouble um, and fixing it. So yeah. using storytelling with service design, I started going to, uh, you know, trying to get as many internships as possible and my last internship on my uh, four year, like my last summer was for Amazon uh, in Seattle, Washington. And I apply, I just, I just, I, you know, just go for it. And I apply yeah. for, as a UX designer, uh, having no idea what UX design was. Uh, I, I had no idea. I had to Google it on like my first day. What That's awesome. UX That's design. awesome. Um, I applied, but I got it. You know, I went through I went through the interview process, which is like, uh, you know, seven interviews of one hour each. So it's not like you just get a call. It's, it's a process yeah. uh, to get to these big companies. And what I brought to the table, although it was not the, the visual skills of what UX design is in the perspective of like everybody else, it was more of storytelling. I was very, very big on details and what makes the people happy and and unhappy and come back and close the app and and the differences in personas and the differences in cultures and how that affects an experience and that's what they they like the most so that's what i said you know you don't have to go to school for ux design to be a ux designer you just have to be a person you just have to yeah. be we are all customers we are all part of this environment so we can all work in it and right so now I work at Bank of America as yeah. um, as the vice president of accessible technology for UX. So I am the person that um, oversee the creation of uh, the app and the website, um, focusing solely, pretty much, on people with cognitive or physical disabilities, making sure that the app works for them. So tell us, you mentioned persona, tell us what is it, for those of us who aren't, you know, user experience, who haven't Googled it and don't work in it, um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about what a user persona is and, and how, you, how you use them, why are they important? For sure, so user personas are um, examples, like I'm, I'm gonna simplify it, right? Okay. Uh, are examples of the everyday folks that will, might use your, your app, Mm -hmm. And so you use them to kind of give you a roadmap as to uh, the use cases or the events that those people might um, encounter before using your app, while using your app, and after using your app. So your app or your website or your experience or whatever it is. So, for example, I, a persona could be, you could write about it. it. It's pretty much a story. It's a fictional story. That's mm -hmm. why writing came yeah. It makes sense, yeah. Can you clutch? I know. Uh, <laughs> it was um, like, for example, um, you can think about how will someone who is blind go up the ramp to go to a coffee shop, mm -hmm. and you literally write the story of what they do, or how will someone who doesn't speak English uh, navigate this app? Based, you know, how can you make it so that they understand where they're going, and you write the story and you um, draw it. Uh, as the best of your abilities and, and, and you guide your experience on these 
people, fictional people that actually represent an enormous amount of the community that you're serving. Um, and, and you have like, for my job, we have personas that, um, that identify with some of the disabilities that we, that we serve. So we have, you know, someone who's blind, someone who have cognitive disabilities like, like um, dyslexia or someone who is in, within the spectrum or uh, someone who can use their arms, someone who uh, can see colors, someone who doesn't speak English, someone who can hear and how, so we make sure that we are designing based on those people. So it's like your roadmap. Gotcha, gotcha. It sounds like user journeys too. I mean, when I teach like UX design, we talk about what's the user journey, what's the user pathways, and there are many of them. <laughs> And it's like you need to do an, an exhaustive search of all of them to, to make sure that whatever you're making fits all the different uses, the use cases, right? For sure. And, and sometimes you can get to everybody. Right. And sometimes you can't serve everybody. Um, this is the reality of the experience. Sometimes mm -hmm. an experience is not going to work for the people that you intended, like all of the people. Uh, but... Um, the more that you think about the people that are going to use your experience, the more likely it is that you like brought it up, the experience for more people, right? Yeah. You think about the, the specificity of the intentionality of the people that you're designing for. Uh, most, most likely you're going to be able to bring even more people to your design. And then, you know, you can better get better with time. Well, that's kind of what I was going to ask next was, you know, how, how can an inclusive philosophy in general influence the social impact of the things that we design? Mm -hmm. How do you see that as being useful? Well, I mean, you have to know what type of people are out there, otherwise they become invisible into, mm -hmm. your, into your experience. And it shows right? It shows when the localization of your Spanish doesn't reflect the different Spanish that they are. Right. Colombian Spanish is not the same as Mexican Spanish. It's not the same as uh, Puerto Rican Spanish. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, you know, it doesn't reflect the people that you're, that are actually using your app. If you, it becomes very, monotonous it just it just becomes one type of one fits all and if you've ever been to a store you know that there's different sizes for a reason because one does not fit all that's that's a lie there was a very big um research back in the 60s about uh, uh the designing of an airplane for pilots in the war and they they design a one fits all and they were all dying because they realized that they were all like they, they had different heights and they had different weights and they had different reach. And that's how you think about your, that's how you have to think about your users. And, yeah. and the best thing that, you know, you can do is just take a walk around your neighborhood. It's, it's that simple. You don't have to be the biggest researcher in the world. Um, when you don't have to work for these big agencies. No, you just, look around and see, hey, how many skin tones do I see? How many languages do I hear? Mm -hmm. um, how many ramps for wheelchairs do I see? How many different fonts? And which one do I understand the best? And which, which colors I can really see? And, and you start realizing the differences in people and, and somehow uh, that translates in your brain into the differences that you have to put into your designs and the personas and the experiences that you got to put. It reflects on your view of the world and how monochromatic or diverse right. you see the world to be. There's a, there's a question that here that came in. It's, you know, about universal design. I mean, inclusive design is very similar. They're kind of in the same realm as universal design. Mm -hmm. which is like a 60s, 70s era, you know, uh, movement, of course, now, you know, it has a lot of different names, but it, it, the question is, is universal design inclusive enough? Do you think that the state of universal design is actually inclusive? Is it meeting its, its uh, original? In inclusive design is universal design, but universal design sometimes is not inclusive. 
So explain that. What do you mean by that? So inclusive design, if you're really thinking about inclusive design, you are actually thinking about the intersectionality of your users, mm. right? Um, let me give you an example. So inclusive design is um, in, in the space where I work in accessibility, inclusive uh, universal design could be yep. just someone, um, a, a dev, a developer, putting all text, alternative text, which is what someone who is blind will hear when using your iPhone or your Android device and putting image mm -hmm. as the old text of a picture. That's universal design. Yeah. Meaning it fits within the norm, it fits the law. It's like, okay, this is, inc this is universally used for these type of people, right? right? right. Inclusive design is about context. Inclusive design is not about an image saying image. Inclusive design is an image being translated, saying mm -hmm. two women having coffee in a park. Right. And so you understand the context of the experience. You're putting the user into the experience. Um, and th that's the difference between uh, inclusive and universal design. So if you, you know, you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm creating, you know, I'm, um, someone who believes in universal design because I'm giving guidelines for uh, all text or, you know, because I checked that, that the blue was darker enough. Right. But if you actually want to be inclusive, you, you got to think about, all right, but if someone can see blue, what this, this, this shade of gray would actually look too dark for them. So they wouldn't really look at it. So it's, it's about context. It's about yes. It's context, about surface. Yeah. Are you staying within here, or are you really going below the iceberg and trying to see what is really, you know, how is, how are things are really created? So, so right now, you know, it's it's 2020. It's late fall. We're coming up to an election. We have just come come through rather scathed from a summer of like a lot of turmoil, a lot of violence. Um, not to mention a whole pandemic, right? Not to mention any of that. Um, and it seems like we're, we're, I really, I mean, personally, I feel like we as a country and as a society are, are kind of now coming to terms with a lot of the problems with design around us in, insofar as it hasn't been inclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like we're, it's all kind of coming to the surface now, like what, where our society hasn't been inclusive. That's why, of course, we're talking about it for this lecture series, because it's a very, it's a hot topic right now. But I think, it'd be, could you, from the perspective of someone who works in user experience and works in considering audiences, considering users, could you maybe talk about, from your perspective, the results of the lack of inclusivity? in design and really even maybe larger, a larger picture, like just the corporate world in general, the design world, what are some of the problems or the pitfalls with ignoring the diversity of your users? I feel like I might get in trouble answering this. Uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> just be nice, just be nice, be, yeah, be diplomatic. Uh, someone is always listening. Uh, you know what, I, um, I think, uh, I think, Society as a whole uh, is noticing the lack, but um, people that belong to so-called minorities, we've we've been knowing this. Right. I you know this is this is not new to nothing us. Nothing new, yeah. Yeah, this is nothing new. I, I I've known you know that things don't have that apps cannot be translated to Spanish, mm -hmm. because I've lived through apps that my mom couldn't use. You know. Uh, to this day, I've known that things, um, that spaces in this in in the world, that parks, that beaches, that 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 places are not accessible, because my dad can use his wheelchair to get there. Um, I know that there's places where uh, I'm not going to be welcome, because I've been to those places and I haven't been welcome. So it's mm. it's not a nuance per se. And that's why, and I think I think that's that's kind of like the, I think the fact that it's not new, is the new part of this because uh, there's so much fake wokeness in all these uh, in since you know 
kind of like since uh, the beginning of of June around uh, around you know murders time and yeah. and there was just so many people saying yeah we're gonna be inclusive yeah we're gonna bring this we're gonna bring that and and there were so many people that were like well we don't believe you. you we haven't done it you guys haven't done it and now you know six months after we've seen that boards are still looking very white that uh, experiences that still are not accessible for screen readers that um places that that, that there's not new policies for cre- bringing more accessible parks for kids or places with more accessibility guidelines for people to actually be able to get there um so i think i think the the fact that we are seeing how the majority of this is is mostly just talk um is 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 putting pressure in companies from this generation that is like you're not gonna lie to us anymore we we this is what you're saying is not matching what you're doing so we're gonna hold you accountable and i think that's the very beautiful part about this is the, is the is this new generation especially um, they're saying we're not gonna buy from you guys anymore because you guys are not doing this, or we're gonna delete your app because you guys are not doing that, and and so it it's like a really great awakening of of companies to the reality of everybody and how everybody is understanding the power of their money and saying you know we're not gonna until you listen to what we're actually saying we're not gonna interact with you and your company. So I think yeah. I think that's that's the part of 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 this time that I'm more excited about. And, and it's gonna translate, I, I'm pretty certain that in you know, Q1, in the first quarter of next year, um, you know, the next um, upgrading apps are going to require uh, companies to actually pay attention to their colors, actually pay attention to the developers that they hire, to the designers that they hire, to the localizations of their language. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen at, for this 2020, but I'm very excited for what's going to happen at the beginning of 2021 when people are actually going back to the budget sheets and saying, well, we're going to have to allocate a lot of money into these spaces. Otherwise, the comp- you know, otherwise we're not going to have users. And, and it's the people who are watching that are, that are making this happening. Yeah. You guys. Well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. You, we, we were talking before we began today about, um, about the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and uh, you were actually concerned that, um, and, and more generally just concerned with if, if the audience here would, would, would understand your accent, and I was explaining to you, well, that's, listen, this is the Bronx, you don't have to worry about that, and <laughs> it's just not a concern. Um, but, I mean, you're gonna fit right in, but, but the concern, then we started talking about, well, if we wanted to use like a closed captioning uh, or, or transcription service like through Zoom, like the platform we're on right now, that it may have trouble with your, your accent. And, and that's concerning to me, right? And you were saying that it's even bigger than that, like per ADA, businesses, schools, institutions could actually possibly be liable for that. So it seemed, you know, I think that I personally believe, and I know you do, that designers, and lar- more largely businesses have a responsibility to the user, to, to their society, to, to inclu- be inclusive and to consider their audience and be responsible participants in the society in which they live. But I also kind of feel that maybe it's not really the individual responsibility to make sure that it happens. Like we, we could do it through laws, but the problem with the ADA as policy is that it's not universally a- applied everywhere. Uh, there is, and there is no mandate in the law, by the way, to apply the ADA. Like bi- communities have to get together to sort sort of instantiate the ADA and make sure it's it's everyone everything's compliant. And it has to. It's almost like this summer was in the last few years has been really good evidence that it's got to get to the point where it's at the lawsuit. It's like it's at litigation time for businesses to change. For the culture to change like how do you feel about that sometimes you, you just gotta go for the bucket and <laughs> where it hurts which is the bottom line mm-hmm. you know at the end at the end of the day everything 
at the end at the end of the day regardless of how nice uh, a company is or regardless how uh you know butterfly their their ideas and their mission and their vision they're still a company and yeah. they still want to make money to sustain the people that you know to pay people salaries and 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 end of the year bonuses so it's still a company and and sometimes you know you just gotta push for change not out of the goodness of people's hearts uh because if, if it was out of the goodness of people's heart they would have done it already so yeah. it's so you know sometimes you gotta push for for it not to get like you gotta you gotta tell them hey you either gonna do it or we're just not gonna use your app we're either gonna do it or we're gonna give you really bad pr which is pretty much like the worst thing that can happen now or yeah. either you're gonna do it or you're gonna get sued like you know you i think you I think society is getting that attitude of like a Latin mom, where it's like, this is what it is. And you're gonna walk this line. Otherwise, is and and sometimes I mean, and sometimes that's the only way that it works. It, yeah. You know, it, it's it's, and I think it's because if you see who is at the top of these corporations, um, it's not it's not this generation. Um, is is not even it's it's not this this is not it. You know, so. Is people that really didn't have to come out of their, they didn't have a need to right. see the otherness. They, they, why would I? You know, it, it, comfortable, but just normalcy. So, right. okay. um, yeah. it takes people who who have had different life experience to push for the changes and to understand uh, how to push for them. And some, yeah. and at the end of the day, you you change by by hurting people's pockets. Um, yeah. And it, you know, it's kind of like how Michelle Obama said, you know, it is what it is, mm -hmm. it, yeah. you know? No, I, yeah, no, I'm on board with that. I, um, this, this is not, this example that I, I was gonna mention is not from the design world, but it is from the storytelling world, which now, as we've been talking, I kind of see, I see a lot of overlap between them. Uh, just, just I think this was just a month ago. The Emmys uh, was broadcast. I mean, virtually. A yeah, a month, a month and a half ago. I can't. Time is. You know what they, what they say. Time is totally. <laughs> it's in, it's in flux. But there were zero nominations for for Latinx people and representation in any of the major categories. Yeah. Um, and that's all about representation and and storytelling and rep presenting the stories of people you know the like minorities people of color um and and another thing i wanted to mention was that the met which is you know the 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 museum one of the world class museums in the world right in manhattan uh just recently uh hired their first full time native american curator which is not necessarily latinx but it is it's well, related. It, it, it is it, in a way, right? Yeah. Because Latin, Latin America is is Native America. Mm -hmm. like, you know, it's the U.S. is the U.S., but yeah. it's the United States of the Americas, and that yeah. includes all of us. So it is. It is Latin. It, it is Native America. I mean. Yeah, I kind of I throw it in the same I throw it in the same category because it's all about representing those voices, and I think it's it's important, but it's just happening now. So I was thinking maybe you could talk about. Um, what the state of representation of, of Latinx voices. And by the way, when I say Latinx, I mean, it, it's sort of synonymous with Hispanic and Latino. I was, I was actually just reading a Pew research document that Latinx is only, like it, it's only, only about 25% of the people that would identify as Hispanic or Latino know the term. And only 3% oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. of those, those, that group would actually use the term to self-identify. So yeah. we mean, you know, we were talking about Hispanic and, and Latino, Latino. But um, I was wondering if you could just comment on the, re yeah, the whole, the whole thing. <laughs> everyone within. Every, everyone with, we're including everyone. Um, yeah. But what is the state of, of the representation in design as you, as you see it? Both uh, in the industry and also as recipients of design. Well, I mean, there's, there is some, um, mm, no. Let's see how I can put this one together. Yeah. You're throwing some, you're throwing some. That's legs. a hard one. That's a yeah, big one. Yeah, you're throwing some interesting ones at me. Uh, the fact that companies have affinity groups, meaning um, small, 
like subgroups within the company, like Amazon has Black Employee Network, mm -hmm. or uh, Bank of America has Ola Hispanic for something. Um, says something about the fact that representation is very limited. That, right. that these big companies, um, you know, that the to be in these companies as a minority, you have to find your little niche to feel like you belong because in the reality, otherwise you don't really see the many people in the company that look like you. I am, um, it, throughout my career as a professional, I've always been the only Latina in my team. Not the only immigrant, but the only immigrant of, of, of uh, Latin descent, uh, the only um, Latina and the only Afro-Latina. Mm. Um, and, and Bank of America, I am the only Afro-Latina vice president in the company. So it is, it, it is a, it is changing from the way that people are now noticing that these groups exist and now companies are giving, are putting more money into the affinity groups to make better events, to create more culture, to bring more people in, to, um, you know, companies are putting more money into where, what colleges they go to, to actually bring, you know, start the pipeline of internships and full-time employees. So yeah, that part is changing, but the fact that we still have those affinity groups is telling you that it's not enough because you still, once you get to these companies, you're still looking for a place to feel like you are in your, in your culture because in the realms and the bigness of everything else, you don't really see yourself represented. And, um, and that's very unfortunate. I mean, in, in, the, in the space of design, um, there's a lot of people that are in HR uh, because Design, like I said, it's not just about designers, it's about researchers, developers, product manager, product manager, HR, right. it's all of the people that create, that help create this app. So I do have um, many, I, I, I have a lot of friends who are within the HR and the, and the program management space of design, but within the de design design, the visual design part of the research uh, or the development part, um, I can count them in like one hand how many yeah. of, of the folks that I know. And, and I, so I, I think, you know, th that's the reason why I do things like this. I, that's the reason why I want people, I, I want uh, young students to hear my accent, to know that, for example, I am DACA recipient. I am an undocumented immigrant. Um, I came here seeking asylum, um, that I am a woman, that I am a black woman, because then, you know, those big companies, the Amazons, the Googles, the Spotify, the Banks of America, the whatever else don't seem so far away. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see yourself represented in those spaces by people, you know, it, sometimes, you know, we, we see those companies as, as something that only certain type of people are able to be in. And unfortunately, the more that we have that mentality, the less that those companies are going to be able to have people within that advocate for those people outside of it. So it's kind of like a, it's like a circle, right? Yeah, you don't see yourself, so you don't apply, and because you don't apply, there's no employees, and because there's no employees, there's no representation. So you don't see. So you know what I'm saying? So there's yeah. there's this circle, uh, and 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 unfortunately, you know, it sometimes just takes tenacity from from the students. Sometimes you just you just gotta say, you know, I I am worth enough to be in this space. I am I am valued enough. I I, you know, I matter and just jump um, apply, you know, like what, what I tell all my mentees is, is like jump and, and learn how to fly as you fall. So sometimes, yeah. you know, there's not a roadmap to get into these companies. Um, so yes, one day you, most of the time you might be the only person, I yeah. have been the only person, but hopefully, you know, by, by being the only person, or more people get to come on yeah. the next five years and, and, and hear like my, my cousin, my cousin is, is in university. She's sophomore. And, and yesterday she asked me if I wanted to have kids because we were talking about stuff and, and I, and I told her yes. And she asked me, why do you want to have kids? Especially knowing how the climate change, knowing the culture, knowing everything that they're going to come. Why do you want to have kids? And that was a very interesting question. And I told her, you know, I want to have kids because I want to see all the work, all the BS that I've been put through, you know, benefit them, you know, benefit the next generation. I want to see how my hard work 
is going to benefit the next people coming after me. Mm. And, and that's pretty much what this is about. It, it, it's about you guys, the people who are listening, for you guys to, to know that you matter and that you're good enough to be a VP at a bank. That's Why not? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm virtually clapping right now, but I don't want to. <laughs> I, I have, right here. I My nose that is itching. Yeah. Um, I have I have questions. I have some questions here. Um, one of them just pertains to what you were just talking about. Was was there a teacher or a mentor uh, when in, during, in your undergrad work where you really sort of pushed you in your educational and professional successes? Um, on the contrary, uh, I had a lot of teachers and professionals who blatantly did not believe in me. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, openly. Mm. Um, obviously, like to your face. You're yeah. like, well, like at least give it to me in the subconscious. But no, <laughs> it, it, I, I am someone who grew up very independent, grew up um, having um, to grow up to mature very early. So I uh, developed thick skin, you know, um, so I use those people um, as propellers, as, um, as ways for me to say, I'm not going to show you, I'm going to show myself that what you're saying is not correct. Um, but that's not the case of everybody. Um, and, 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 you know, when I was in high school, I started college. Uh, I started having an, an AA, an associate degree um, in 10th grade. Um, I don't know why oh, I did wow. it was very wow. horrible. I had only yeah. speak English for like three years. And so I came into, uh, it was like half school, half college. And my mom dropped me. Uh, thanks, mom. And she, <laughs> um, you know, my first class that I ever took in college, uh, uh, it was uh, public speaking. And at that time, my accent was 10 times thicker. And I have braces and my English, my, my speaking English wasn't that good because uh, when I first got here, I learned how to write English before I learned how to speak it. Uh, so I could write like, you know, a full on, you know, professor, like you, you, but you hear me and you're like, who, the, who is this person? Yeah. And my professor, you know, I wrote, I wrote a, a feminist paper uh, my first public speaking event was called, you know, learn to, um, like in class, was learn, uh, learn to wear the pants without losing your heels. That was my first, uh, like, writing paper for my speaking class. Uh, and she gave me a zero on the paper. And she wrote, I do not believe you wrote this. And, and I have used that type, and it was a woman. I'm like, okay, thank you, Karen. Um, and I've used and I've used that type of of people. I use that type of energy to say, to say, uh, you know, I'm just gonna let you be ugly to yourself. Like I'm not gonna let that tint tint me. Like why? Like you're not you're not worth that much for me to care. So no, so that that's how I have pushed for it. Uh, and, and by having that mentality, I, I, I think I've been able to navigate the spaces where they really don't want me in or the spaces that are really not designed for someone who is like me and advocate for those spaces to have more people who are like me. And, but, um, and I, in, in these spaces, I, be, I became mentor for Girls Who Code and I've mentored in my university and, and I mentor within, within Bank of America to like interns who want to learn how to do your resume and stuff like that or how to nail an interview which i've been to too many um because i know how important it is to have a roadmap and uh, to see someone in the spaces that you want to be uh, because it's sometimes it's hard to be what you can see but i but it's also not completely necessary for you to 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 you know to survive to thrive uh in the spaces it, it's it's important yes and it would be fantastic if anyone so everyone has a mentor, but it comes from hunger. You know, it comes from within um, and how, how bad you want it and how little you care about other people's, you know, like, like in Colombia, we have a thing called like, like it just, whatever, just, I don't really care 
Bajuju, go away. Yeah, like, but you'd fit right in here in the Bronx, man. I mean, you, <laughs> uh, the the I mean, we're predominantly uh, women at, at Lehman. The students are predominantly female, and it's they're very proud and very strong, uh, just like you. So it's great to it's great to have you sort of mirror what I see from my own students. Not that the not that the guys aren't also amazing, but I mean, it's really amazing to you know. Um, there's a question, another question here. Women, especially women of color tend to account for the majority of the population of consumers. Um, do you think companies choose to ignore this information? Uh, and what else could we do to change this aside from just hurting the bucket, as you said? Wow, you have very smart too. Oh, well, this is, yeah, she's also, I you have very smart. know her well, and she's very brilliant. So this is what I'm talking about. I mean, it's like, you know, they're already- I'm, this, I'm, I'm very excited for this generation to get back, to get mm -hmm. into to the, these companies because yes, they're just right. messing up and I'm just going to be like yeah, yeah. that's like, Lehman that's what we do <laughs> burn it down um, no I'm just kidding uh, but what you know I think I think yes uh, women move economies and 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 women are regardless of your machi of whomever machismo's mentality is women are the center and they are the pushers and they're the backbone and the head um, but, but the pool of development is majority uh, men. The pool of designers are men. The pool of researchers are men. The pool of PMs are men. The pool of CEOs, you get the point? So it, I don't think it's, it, it's, the, it's not that they choose to ignore it. They just don't even know what they're ignoring. You don't yeah. even like, how are you gonna know what you're not putting where you don't even know what it is? Yeah. So uh, there are spaces that, that just don't work for women because there's not women in it. Uh, like that's, that is the simplification of it. And, and, I th and I think that's why it's important for us to stop thinking about design as just UX design or developers. Because if you have a, uh, a PM, a program manager that is a woman, she's going to be the one saying like, wait, but this research is not full concluded. What, where, what is this demographic? Yeah. Or if you have a, a, someone who is a manager and it's a woman, then they're going to be like, um, I like your design, but why are all the personas in your, in your documentation male and right. in the 35 and, you know, heads of household. So is, is the diversity of, of the employees that changes the experiences and, um, and, and I can, I can say, I, I can't talk about what, what has happened before because what has happened is just white people, male everywhere, but I'm very excited for what is coming um, into the spaces with like black girls who code and girls who code. Uh, women of all ethnicities, um, women and and um, people that identify as women uh, uh, or females that are in these experiences, saying, you know, I, I either you're gonna put me in this place or I'm just gonna go and create my own space uh, right. and take away the the consumer base that you're ignoring. So, you know, that's I don't think it's a it's a it's a conscious decision. It, they just don't know. Right. Yeah, men are not very good listeners. I can, I can, I can tell you that we just don't know how to listen. Uh, it's a constant <laughs> uphill battle for me. Um, not just as a designer, but as a father, as a husband. It's I can tell you we're just not good at it. So that's one reason. That's our biggest challenge. I have a question from. We just we just gotta get better at it. Then. Yeah, we just gotta get better, guys. Yeah. We gotta get better. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, I have a question from, the, she's actually my student in a class I'm teaching right now. She's brilliant. Uh, and her questions, this is another tough one. Have you ever experienced a moment where you were chosen or propositioned by a company or organization to join their team slash creative project simply because of your ethnicity instead of your creative technical skills that you were able to bring to them? I think it's nice that more people of ethnicity and color are being represented in media, the arts and design, but I feel like they're also being defined by who they are discovered by, by only race or whatever the indicator is. How do you feel about that? Damn. Yeah, that's a- I, I mean, you're, you're the 
congratulations. Uh, well, she is uh, this this particular student. I don't mean to brag about her. I'm not going to name her and embarrass her, but her work is she's at the level where she could go and she should be out looking for jobs and internships and whatnot. And she, you know, she, this is a real concern for our students because the design world, the entertainment world, just as we've been talking about today, are kind of now bending over backwards. Mm -hmm. to, and, and the danger is, you know, they want to hire a more diverse crowd because they want to appeal to a diverse audience. But are they doing it for nefarious purposes to make, you know, to make money? Yeah, like, like the tokenization of people. Tokenization, yeah, that's the danger. So how have you sort of experienced? I, I, um... Or have you experienced? I it? have been in spaces um, in my professional career, so not including my internship. My, my, I, I went to an internship in Oskosh, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So yes, I was the only black person in that company. But in my professional after school experience, I have been, um, luck, no, I'm not quite lucky because it's not really luck, but I have been in places where my teams are actually very diverse. There's a lot of women. Uh, my teams have been predominantly women and, and female and people who identify as women uh, and has been very immigrant minorities uh, demographic. So that's, you know, the good thing about that. Yes, I'm still the only Latina, but it doesn't mean that I'm the only person. It, it, I might be the only Latina, but this person is the only, you know, South Asian, and this person is the only European. So if we're the only, but we come together as being all of them. So yes, but I think what you can think of it as, as you start moving into into getting ready to to apply for internships and spaces is is just take the opportunity and mold it to feed your purpose. Um, so yes, you might get hired because they want to have a woman in the space. But then now think about it. Now you're the woman in that space. Mm -hmm. Now you have that power. Now you can say, hey, hold on, wait a minute. What about these people? What about, um, or you can say, um, yeah, you know what? I want to have an intern when you get to that level. I want to have an intern and I'm focusing on having an, a woman intern because I'm the only woman here. Or you can go to your manager and say, hey, um, when are we gonna hire another woman? A person who identifies women. Um, you have that power once you get in there. So don't get turned off by the fact that you might be the only one because it takes the first person to then bring everybody else. So someone at one point was the first. Right. And, and, and pioneering is dangerous. Pioneering is hard. Uh, but it's very rewarding at the end uh, because now you hold the power to open doors and to, you know, to pull as you climb more people uh, and, and you have that power once you get in there. So you, you might be the only person, but for how long, you know, think about that or, or what power do you have once you get in there? Because um, someone always going to have to be the first. It is what it is right now and, until you're not. Right. And then maybe you're the reason why that change. So, so go for it, apply for the internship, apply for the job, regardless of, of whether or not you think that you're going to be the token. And, and if you get, if you get accepted and if you get to the job, stand proud of the fact that you're the only person. Don't think that is, you know, an affirmative action type of thing because affirmative action benefits white women only. Um, right. Think about the fact that you're in the space because you have earned it. And now you have the power of that space. Like they are lucky to have you. You are the price, not the job. Change the narrative. Excellent, excellent advice. Uh, I was gonna ask a question about the future, but I actually have another question here from a student who is basically asking with the way that the state of media uh, and that includes design and communication today with the noise that we're inundated with, with the election, uh, with the pandemic, how do you, well, I, and also the fact that we're in ingrained in us is, is this idea that we really don't have very much power uh, anyway to get our voices heard. How do you suggest um, people get their voices heard from a design standpoint? How can they get their work? seen and heard above 
all this immense amount of noise that we're living with on a daily basis? For sure. I mean, um, someone is always looking for the new. That's literally their job. Someone's job is to look for new, new people to come into places and to disregard the noise. That's literally someone's job. Mm. Um, so don't, everyone gets discouraged. Everyone gets sometimes, you know, uh, distracted. It happens to me. Sometimes I have to take the afternoon because there's just too many things coming at me. Um, and I'm human, you know, but I, I think, I think you just gotta stay true to your hopes and like what you want to see for yourself and keep creating and keep pushing and, um, and kill your babies, which means right. don't take literature, which means, uh, push something out there, whether or not you think it's fantastic, put it on Behance, put it on Pinterest, put it on LinkedIn, use LinkedIn, put it on your Instagram page, put it on TikTok, put it in whatever else come after. I am not that known about the new stuff that these kids are using, but put it whatever it is that, that, that you want people to see it because someone is always watching um, for new talent. And, and as you can see, the millennial uh, are right now, the millennial and the generation Z are the people right now that, that are getting into this powerful position. Um, like, you know, Kirby, which is a, an African-American designer. He just became the vice president of design for Adidas. Like what, like is their place and he's like around my age. So there's places in, in, in there, there's people in higher places that are looking for the new ones, but they're always, the, you know, it's your job to just keep on producing, keep on producing, whether or not you think that is fantastic or not, just, just put it out there and let the people give you the critique for the free. I wish I could have had someone for free look at my, my resume, like, you know, my visual resume and give me some feedback. Just keep on, keep on producing regardless of the noise because the noise is always going to be there. My, right now in my field, like it's too heavy because we don't have the distractions of the movies and of the events and of the awards of the concert, but the noise have always been there. Things have always been brewing, uh, whether you see it or not, it's, it's right. always scheming. Someone is always trying. Um, so it's your job to just stay consistent and stay true to yourself um, and utilize the resources that your university has, your, your teachers and, and use their I'm sorry for giving you more job, more work, but use their open <laughs> talent and ask questions. That's and show the work we like. We like that work. Like that's, that's the whole point of right now being in school. Yeah. You're a professional, you're a professional student and your job right now is to keep producing um, regardless of the noise because the noise is always going to be there. And if you let the noise like shut you up, then the noise wins and that's not the point, yeah. you know? Excellent. Well, listen, thank you so much, Laura, uh, for, for meeting with us. Um, I hope we can do this again. I hope we can do this like every year. La Laura and I, by the way, are planning like a whole other lecture series just because during our discussion. So we're, we're already like planning the next move. But anyway, thank you again. Uh, I, I was actually, it just occurred to me today that um, this is National Hispanic Heritage Month and it ends like on the 15th. So we're getting this like in just under the wire, which I think is really great. So thank you again for making the time, taking this out of your schedule. And uh, I look forward to, to keeping the conversation going. And thanks also for everybody else who attended and, and really asked some pretty amazing questions um, that Laura was, was able to confidently answer. I, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, um, you know, I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and in the comments, uh, I'm gonna put yeah. in all panels. I'm gonna put my alias, which means that you're gonna be able to find me on Instagram or LinkedIn or cool. even my Medium. And I know that there were some other questions that we didn't get the chance to, and and I promise I'll do my best to answer uh, in a timely matter. Uh, you know, sometimes sometimes you can't do all the things, but I'm yeah. gonna try to yeah. do my best. Uh, and you know, I, it was fantastic. Uh, I. I it was my goal to go see you guys live, but 
2021. Yeah. Uh, and, but uh, hopefully when things get safer and, and cleaner, uh, we'll be able to meet in person and, and, and just keep having conversations because this is the way that, that we change the world just by not getting to know each other and getting to know what each person thinks and, and where each person is. And I have so much to learn from this generation. Um, I want to know what you guys think and what are your guys' dreams and your ambitions and, and how, I, how I can help you guys achieve it. Because otherwise, then why am I here for if it's right. not for, for you guys? And so super thankful for this opportunity. Uh, please, everyone, stay safe. Uh, don't go out to parties. Take care of your grannies and your grandmas, your abuelita, abuelito. They're old. Take care of them. And... and um, you know. Oh, and we want to plug your um, we want to plug your class too. So, Laura is going to be teaching co-teaching a class with the Latin American Studies Alicia Galvez in Latin American Studies, and uh, it's gonna, essentially going to be uh, looking at the intersection of immigration and design. So, looking at immigration, our immigration policy, such as it is, um, from a design perspective, and thinking about rethinking it, and kind of like coming up with interesting solutions. So. Look for it in the spring. It's going to be cross-listed in, uh, in Art 350, a special topics in art, uh, and then a Latin American studies uh, section. So super excited. I'm, yeah, as a mom. I'm waiting for you guys to yep. you guys push me to be better. So give me all the flame, give me all the fire, so cool. that so that this this class could be amazing. Um, thank you guys, and 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 I can't wait for the next time. Seriously. Yep. This is, this is fantastic. Me and my plants, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day, okay? All right, bye-bye.